Hey everybody, welcome back to Bible Fun with the Duns. Today we're looking at Judges chapter number 10. Now again, you got the JV squad with you again today. Uh, Jenny and I, we just dropped the kids off at school, so they're not with us today. Because if your May is like us, uh, it's the other December of the year. Where it's like everything else goes on every night and we're just doing the best we can to get by. So today we're looking at uh, Judges chapter number 10. Now here's, here's kind of where we are. We've gone from Gideon to his son Abimelech, now to uh, uh, now to a guy named Tola, and then to a guy named Jair. And this is going to feel a little weird to you because you've been several days dealing with Gideon's family. Just remember, there's more said about Gideon than any other judge. There's 100 verses about him. There's 99 verses about Samson. So they are the exceptions to the norm, not the norm. Most of the judges are just really quick events, and some of them just kind of have passing glances. And that's what we find here in chapter number 10. For instance, look in verse number one. It says, after Abimelech, there arose to save Israel, Tola, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo, the man of Issachar, who dwelt in Shamir and the mountains of Ephraim. Now, let me just make a few passing comments here. First of all, number one, these are terrible names. And I'm Dodo. so glad, yeah, I'm glad our kids aren't. <laughs> Uh, reading them because we'd never get through them. They would think the names of Pua and Dodo, that we, we would be done right there, okay? So um, just just notice kind of the information we have about him because there's the next thing it says. And he judged Israel 23 years and he died and was buried. Now, first of all, this guy's name means worm. That's mighty, right? Not a great name. It's also not mentioned that he's a bearer of the Spirit. So the Spirit comes upon Samson, the Spirit comes upon Gideon, the Spirit comes upon other judges, but this guy's never mentioned as being a, a, a Spirit bearer. Now, he does have a long tenure as a judge, but really, it's that's a long tenure without remembrances. It never says anything that he did. Matter of fact, the next guy is kind of in the same situation, Jair, after him, Jair, a Gilead, and he judged Israel 22 years. And uh, here's the only thing it says about him. He had 30 sons who rode on 30 donkeys, and they had they had 30 towns. And it just talks about what his kids have. So 30 sons riding 30 donkeys. Now remember, in this time, wealthy people rode donkeys. So generals rode horses, soldiers rode horses, uh, rich people rode donkeys, and poor people walked. The really, really rich, they rode white donkeys. I mean, they, these were the cream of the crop. And he's got 30 sons who rode on 30 white donkeys. I mean, this guy's very, very wealthy. Um, but what J. Vernon McGee says here, which I've always liked, he says, this guy's an example of somebody who has affluence, but no influence. So you take these two guys, and what does the scripture say about them other than how long they were there? Nothing. So one guy, well, he provided financially for his family, but there's no remembrance of what these people did to bring the people closer to the Lord God. So they served a spot, but they didn't have any influence. And that's that's not real great. And it kind of lets us know why when we get down to verses six through the rest of the chapter, why Israel might, might be in this same cycle of sin again, because what if they had leaders but no leadership. And so, uh, you know, as we read through this, we, we read through this thinking, man, we, we've got to think generationally. Most of us just think, what do I got to do today when I think the scripture is really pointing us to what's the long-term influence of our lives? That's an important concept here. Jim, what was your takeaway? I am struck by the heart of God in this. We, Dustin and I kind of laugh because we're so different. Like, I'm going to get all the touchy-feely feelings out of this, and he's going to get the factual, which makes us a good team. We we see different things. Um, but we're in a in a bad place right now as the Israelites. We're in a, a bad place as far as our relationship with the Lord goes. We've talked about this cycle that we see um, of relationship with between God and the Israelites, and so today, some verses that stuck out to me, we start in verse six. It says, the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. 
And they served the Baals and the Ashtaroth, the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the Ammonites, and the gods of the Philistines. And they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. They're basically reaching and grasping for anything except the one true God, except the very God who has saved them, who has walked with them, who has proven himself to them over and over and over again. Y'all know I'm studying the Trinity and I have been for quite a quite a while. Quite, <laughs> so quite. Time. Um, and so to to see the heart of God the Father in this, um, it makes me it makes me mad at the Israelites, but it also makes me mad at myself for when I live in this exact same way. So later in this chapter, verse sixteen says, "So they put away the foreign gods." Uh, from among them, and they served the Lord, and he became impatient over the misery of Israel. So, we see this cycle of Israel turning to God, and they, it's so obvious that they flourish as they follow God. They're winning uh, their battles when they are uh, following God and worshiping him and serving him as their one true God. They're, they're doing well, but in that flourishing and in that time of prosperity and doing well, they seem to forget God. They maybe fall out of the habit of their daily relationships with him. Maybe fall out of the habit of their rituals, what they would do to um, have spend time with God. And they get complacent. And then we see them, oh, look, there's another God over here. There's another thing that, that gets their heart, that gets their worship. And then they turn away from him. And as they turn away, they start losing battles. I mean, the, the proof is in the pudding. It's obvious. But to, to think about it from God the Father, from his perspective, it says he became impatient over the misery of Israel. I can't imagine what it's like, how it breaks his heart to watch his kids um, choose everything but him, how that has to break his heart. And so um, it just makes me more aware of my own walk with him. It reminds me um, in these times where I'm not having a trial or hardship, that encourages me to pursue the Lord even more so that I don't grow complacent, so that I don't um, turn away and start looking to other things and give them my heart and my worship, just like the Israelites did. Yeah. I think in verse six, where it talks about what you just read, where it says, and they served the Baals and the Asterisks, the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of Ammon, the gods of the Philistines, and they forsook the Lord. I mean, it's not like these weren't spiritual people but they weren't the right spiritual kind of people. They they literally had respect for every other God the world could throw at them, except the one true God. And yet we see the character and the mercy of God uh, where it says down in verse 16, and his soul could no longer endure the misery of Israel. Well, what was their misery? Was their misery that they were oppressed or was that their misery or was their misery that their soul was dried up because it had been so disconnected from him. You know, I, I think whenever we uh, whenever we read through this, you and I need to give good attention to what are the things that we really worship. Now, we, we would say, oh, we worship Jesus. We, we love the Lord. But what do we really worship? What do we really lay our lives down to? We And probably there's a lot of things we give little pieces of our heart away to. And, and then we wonder why, why is there this kind of disconnect, this, this dryness, this emptiness in our own heart and we're miserable and we don't, we can't even explain why. Well, what if it's because our hearts get divided at times, serving and being laid down at the feet of a lot of different other things when really God is where our, our heart belongs. And so today, why don't we just take a moment to just kind of rein things in a little bit and say, God, uh, this world is going to throw a lot at me today, but today I want you, I want you to be so first that there's not even room for a second. I want you to be my all in all today. So let, let's let that be our main push and we'll head to Judges chapter number 11 tomorrow. All right. See you later. Bye. Bye.